So last week, we started a new series of teaching in line with our focus for the month, which is Unveiling Jesus. We considered the message titled, Put the Attention on Jesus. And by way of a quick recap, we established that the results of the recent census of England and Wales showed that for the first time in the history of these two nations, the proportion of people who identify themselves as Christians dropped below 50%. And the concerning thing is that this is not a blip, but the result of a trend that started several years ago. I referred to an article in the Daily Mail from 2012 in which it was predicted that 2030 will be the year that Britain stops being a Christian nation. Because according to this article, that would be the year that the number of people who identify as secularists, and that, that group secularists is a fairly broad group. It comprises of those who identify themselves as atheists, those who identify themselves as agnostics, humanists, they all fall under this category. So that number will surpass the number of Christians by 2030. That's the prediction. And this was based on data from the House of Commons Library that says every year in this country, Christianity loses 500,000 people and the secularists gain 750,000 people. So it's no brainer that at some point, if that trend continues, the number of secularists would outstrip the number of Christians. So we then considered what can be done to arrest this trend after talking about the implications for us as a society. We concluded that the people who change the world for God are those people who decide to take a stand for God above everything else in their life and bring their faith to bear on their world. We looked at the life of a man by the name Atostas, an Australian who armed with a piece of chalk in his hand and a vision from God in his heart, wrote the word eternity and estimated 500,000 times over a period of 35 years on pathways, pavements, and platforms in Sydney and its suburbs for all to see and made people ponder about the question of their eternity. That was an example of a man that took a stand for God. This morning, we want to consider the subject of taking a stand some more. I said last week that the message is in two parts, so I will bring this part to a conclusion today. And my message is aptly titled, Take a Stand. Please turn with me your Bibles to Daniel chapter 1, as we read verses 1 to 15. Daniel 1, verses 1 to 15. In the third year of the reign of Joachim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Joachim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shina to the house of his God, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. Young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Ananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. But Daniel proposed in his heart that he will not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. 
and the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you will endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had said to Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days, and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you, and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them ten days. Now verse 15. And at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Now, that's a long read, but quite a few things there. So in the verses that we've just read, we can see that there are a few strategies which King Nebuchadnezzar employed, and he had one goal. His goal was to naturalize these Hebrew captives to the ways and culture of the Babylonians, so that in his own estimation, at the end of three years, they will be fit to serve in the king's court. So he had a strategy, and he put that in place through his uh, chief guard to implement that strategy. Now, these strategies, there are five of them in total. We'll be talking about them. They are strategies that are very effective in achieving naturalization and are still being employed today by both the kingdom of God and the world system. The only difference is that in God's kingdom, that strategy is employed positively. In the kingdom of darkness, the goal is a negative one. Whether we are mindful of it or not, the world system is constantly trying to change us or at least to subdue us if it cannot change us through the application of these strategies. And the Bible says we must not be ignorant of the devices of the enemy. So it's important that we understand these strategies. It's instructive that the nation that the Bible is referring to here in this text is the nation of Babylon. Although the physical nation of Babylon is history and it's far gone, the spirit of Babylon predates the existence of the nation of Babylon and continues even today. To know this is to know wisdom. The spirit of Babylon was first revealed in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 11, we're going to read very quickly again from verse 1 to 9 for us to see the spirit of Babylon at work. This was long before the nation of Babylon came into existence. The Bible says now the whole earth had one language and one speech. Verse 2, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shina and they dwelt there. Now, when Nebuchadnezzar took the captives, the Bible says, where did he take them to? Shina. Remember that. Okay. Then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord God came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the people said, and the Lord said, Indeed the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down. And there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And verse 8, So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the, uh, the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel. So that's where Babylon came from. Because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. This is the spirit of Babylon at work. Now, on the surface, when you read those nine verses, you may be thinking, well, but, but what is wrong in their plan? Why, why did God have to go and scatter them? 
on the surface, it looks like there was nothing wrong in what they planned to do. They say, let us stay together. Is it wrong to want to stay together? Let us use our creativity and build a tower up to heaven. Up until this point, nobody had built a tower. So it doesn't look like there was anything wrong in it. Maybe the one you may say may be too ambitious was, let us make a name for ourselves. But everything else seemed okay on the outside. To the undiscerning mind, you will say there's nothing wrong in all of this. And this is the deception of the spirit of Babylon. On the surface, the goal looks innocent. It looks like there's nothing wrong with it. But when you probe further, you see a deeper goal as well, at work that is a goal that is at variance to God's purpose. When I begin to use examples of modern day, you will see what I mean. On the surface, the fight is for equality. And what is wrong in equality? God created us to be equal. That's what it looks like on the surface. But deep down, there's a deeper goal that is a conflict, that is at variance with what God wants to achieve. And God's purpose here, these people were at conflict and variance with God's purpose. Because in 10 chapters earlier, God made his purpose clear for creation. Let us create man in our image. Let them be fruitful. Let them multiply. Let them fill all the earth. It was never God's intention that all of human civilization will be concentrated in one city, however big that city is. So these people were at variance with God's goal and God's plan. And God had to go down to, uh, to change their language, bring confusion in their midst so that they could scatter. They had to now identify each other on the basis of the people who could speak their language and then found different places on the earth to settle so that God's purpose could come to pass. So the spirit of Babylon, therefore, is the spirit that directly opposes the advancement of God's kingdom and the fulfillment of God's plan on earth. That spirit remains very active in the world today, even if the nation Babylon no longer exists. That spirit is very active in this nation where we reside. Do not be deceived. That spirit is at work in pretty much every nation of the earth because Satan is called the God of this world. The book of Revelations is a book that is, according to the name, a revelation of the things that are to happen in the end times. In several chapters in the book, even though there are things to happen in the end times, accounts are given of how God finally brings the spirit of Babylon to judgment. Revelations chapter 14 verse 8 is an example. Revelations 14 8. It says, And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is falling, is falling, that great city, because she had made all nations drink of uh, the wine of the rot of her fornication. So the Bible is not referring to the Babylon nation that is already falling here. It's referring to the spirit of Babylon. And it's interesting to me that it says one of its main crimes is to make all nations drink of its wine of the rot of fornication. In NKJV or is it NLT? My, my Bible is NLT. It talks about the wine of sexual immorality. Revelation 17, 5. We see that again. This is the spirit of Babylon at work. On, on our forehead, a name was written. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of Hanots and of the abominations of the earth. That's the spirit of Babylon at work. Not only is it against God's agenda on earth, it is also, its goal is to spread fornication and sexual immorality across the earth. That's the deeper goal beyond the surface that looks innocent called equality. And God said something very instructive in that passage in Genesis chapter 11 verse 6. And we can read that again. He said, and the Lord said, indeed the people are one and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Now that's very instructive. If God himself could say that, that these people, if I don't do something to divide them, even I cannot oppose what they want to do. Nothing that they do. 
And God had to confuse their language to divide them. And the message is very clear. A people that are united around the goal, whether the goal is a good one or a bad one, will always present a strong force that will be difficult to overcome. A people that are united the goal, whether it is a good goal or a bad goal, because they are united, no matter their numbers, would always present a strong force that would be difficult to overcome. And this is the source of strength of the kingdom of darkness. It's that unity of purpose. Even Jesus recognized this. Once the Pharisees accused Jesus that he was casting out demons using the spirit of Beelzebub, and Jesus responded that this cannot be true because a house that is divided against itself cannot stand. If I cast out Beelzebub, a demonic spirit, through the spirit of Beelzebub, that is a kingdom divided against itself. So as foolish as Satan is, he's wise enough to know that he must always present a united front. And even with the spirit of Babylon, their strength, the strength is in unity, presenting a united front. Now let me ask you a question. What proportion of the UK do you think identify as LGBT? What proportion? Anybody? Just hazard a guess. What proportion? Five? Ten? Eighteen? You'll be surprised. The latest data says only 3.1% of the population of the UK identify as LGBT. Only 3.1%. Yet it feels like they are the 96.9% that don't identify as LGBT. Why? The strength. The strength in unity. Now, currently... The FIFA World Cup is in its semi-final stage. I must say that at the beginning of the World Cup, I wasn't, I wasn't particularly interested. For someone, I've, my life is busy, so I didn't even remember that World Cup would start. World Cup had started for a few days before I finally got to know that the World Cup had started. But what made me aware that the World Cup had started? It was two words. One, love. Those were the two words that made me aware that the World Cup had started. So it was not even about the teams that were playing. How many of you heard of the One Love protest? Yes. Not many of you. Okay. Maybe some of you are even busier than myself <laughs> if you didn't hear. Amen. Now, that One Love, for those that didn't know about it, was the, 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 the campaign phrase or logo for the uprising against FIFA and the nation of Qatar because Carter says, according to our laws, for these six weeks or six months, however the World Cup lasts, we are not a nation that allows homosexuality. So if you come here and you practice it and we catch you, then your life is going to go. And all of the rest of the world, well, not all, most, led by our nation, England, Germany, Belgium, all of them, they were going to protest. And their protest was that the captains will wear an armband that has one love on it in, in, in protest against Qatar and FIFA against lack of inclusion in their world. Now, I have my views about the World Cup going to Qatar. Uh, I believe the World Cup should go around the world, but I don't think Qatar is the right place. And I believe all the story that there were corruption on the ground in terms of going there. So I have views about that. But at the same time, you cannot go to another person's nation and tell them how to run their nation. It's not only arrogance, it's ignorance of the highest level to want to go to another person's nation and tell them how to run that nation. But whatever the case is, the noise was so much that at some point I became confused as to what the competition was all about. Is it about football or is it about something else? Because although it's called FIFA World Cup, football got completely relegated to the background. It was all about LGBT. It was almost like it was LGBT finale rather than a World Cup finale. That was what it was. That shows you what can be achieved. And 3.1% is the proportion of LGBT in this nation. In some other nations of the world, I'm sure there are not as many as that. But see the kind of united front they presented 
that the whole world got, they got the attention of the whole world. That shows you what can be achieved when a small group of people present a united front. They are difficult to beat. Now, let me go to those five strategies that Nebuchadnezzar used that the spirit of Babylon still uses even today. Number one strategy is this. Attack the home. Attack the home. The Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem. He attacked it and he took its citizens captives. This was the very first thing that Nebuchadnezzar had to do to start that process of naturalization. If he didn't attack the home, he would not be able to take them captive. And when he took them captive, he did not take them captive in their home country. He took them away to his own home country. He wanted them to be as far away from their home as possible. Why? Because home is more than just a place where you live. It is the place where you derive your identity from. Your name comes from your home. There's a reason that I'm called Henry Akitunde. That's because I was born into the Akitunde family. And there's a lot of history behind that name. My values, my culture, my sense of how I run a family, my support system, all of those derive from the home. If you disconnect a person from their home, you disrupt all of the above. You disrupt their sense of identity, their culture, their support system, and more. This is why the spirit of Babylon attacks the home even today, is to attack all of these things. And that's why some people do not even know their identity. They don't know who they are today because of all these attacks against the home. In today's world, there's not only an attack against the home, there's an onslaught against the home. Be it the rise of divorce, the rise of homosexuality, the rise of unguarded feminism. And I use the word unguarded feminism because in the original intent, that fight for equality between men and women, I support feminism in that role. I believe God created man and woman equal. I believe that. But feminism that wants to reverse the order that God has put in the home between man, woman, and children, that feminism I counter if it goes against the order that God has already put. So there's that attack against it. The, the feminism that wants to emasculate the man, as it were, give him no sense of what, and promote the woman above the home. That is a feminism that attacks the natural order that God puts in the home. My body, my choice movement, I'm against that. It was Ronald Reagan that said at some point in time, and I paraphrase, he said, I noticed that all the people who fight for abortion rights have already been born. <laughs> Did you notice that? So if they were, had been aborted, they would not be fighting for abortion rights. He said, so have you noticed all the people that fight for it, they've already been born. So it's easy because they were not aborted. They are now fighting for other people to be aborted. And I thought that's, that's a powerful word of wisdom. Trust Ronald Reagan. He's got some of those words like that. The breakdown of social values. All of these are attacks against the home by the spirit of Babylon disguised as the secular movement. You cannot afford to be ignorant of this. This is the first thing that the spirit of Babylon does. Attacks you because the home is the bedrock of the society. If the home goes, that society goes. Values go down the drain. As the home begins to break down, every sort of structure, solid structure you see, in the society begins to go. And that is why the home is always attacked by the spirit of Babylon. The second thing that Nebuchadnezzar did was to change their names, to change their names. In many cultures, a name is beyond what a person is called. A name tells a story and often speaks to a person's destiny. One of the strategies of the spirit of Babylon described, disguised as secularism is to change the names of Christians. If as a believer, you align yourself with the Bible's stand about the home, about sexuality, and about other issues, the society will call you a different name. They'll call you intolerant. They'll call you bigoted. They'll call you a non-progressive. And the list goes on and on. Now, what do you think 
The goal of all this is to give you a different name so that Christianity stops being attractive to the untrained mind. The young, the young person hears a believer being called this sort of names. They don't want to associate with that. They don't want to be called as intolerant. They don't want to be seen as bigoted. They don't want to be seen as people who are not progressive because you put that label on Christianity and when you do that, everybody associated with that religion goes with that name. If people perceive you as intolerant, as outdated, as non-progressive, then they don't want to associate with you. So what happens? Christians are then forced to do one of three things. Either dissociate from Christianity, which is what is happening to the vast majority of the 500,000 people a year who leave Christianity, or you are forced into silence, and that's for you not to declare your unacceptable stand, as it were. Or you are bold to declare that you're on the Lord's side, no matter what, you are, what name you are called. And unfortunately, that third category are in the minority. The spirit of Babylon is succeeding in getting people to fall into one of these first two categories. Either leave Christianity or be subdued into silence. This is the second way the spirit of Babylon operates. The third thing Nebuchadnezzar did here was to change their language. Change their language. The four Hebrew boys and all the other captives were required to learn the language of the Babylonians. This was partly to make them forget their own language. Secondly, it was to make them think like the Babylonians. Whether you know it or not, you think in a particular language. You think in a particular language. Whether you, and sometimes when it becomes popular is when you are having a conversation with somebody who thinks in a different language. I remember my mentor was, one of my mentors was one of the first people that brought this to my attention. He was saying, back then I was still in Nigeria, he said, I traveled all the way from, I think it was Lagos to Akure, and this is a, a journey of more than 100 miles. And he went to see somebody, this was the days before mobile phones and all of that, so you could show to people's house, uh, show in front of people's doors without notice and letting them know. And when he got there, he met the wife and he was like, oh, I've come to see this person. And the wife said, oh, he's sleeping. And he said to the wife, do you realize I've come all this way to see? And the woman got angry. How can you say to me, do you realize and all of that? And he was thinking, what have I said? I, I came all this way, do you realize? But you see, he thinks in English, she thinks in Yoruba. When you translate, do you realize in Yoruba, it almost sounds like, are you dumb enough not to know that I hear? <laughs> so, and that's why she got angry. So, it's not the words that were said, it's the language in which she thinks. So, by changing their language, it's to, the goal is to change their thinking. If you make them think in the language of the Babylonians, then they have a Babylonian mindset. That was the goal. So, today, there are certain types of language that was considered normal language 10 to 15 years ago, but they are no longer acceptable today because they are not politically correct. Certain words that meant different things before today now mean something entirely different. If I said to you, church, I am gay, what would you think? What comes to your mind right now? Yeah? That's what comes to your mind. But if I said that 15 years ago, I am happy, is what I am saying. That word means a whole different thing today. Tolerance means something totally different. It no longer means the right to disagree, but still coexist peacefully. That's the original meaning of tolerance. That I can disagree with you on something, we can have our differences, but it does not stop us from coexisting peacefully. Today, if I degree, disagree with your stand, I am considered intolerant. Okay? So it means a whole different thing. The rainbow is no longer a sign of God's covenant with man. When God put the rainbow, he said, this will be a reminder to you that I'm never going to destroy the earth with water again. The rainbow doesn't mean that when you see rainbow everywhere now, it's a whole different thing. It is something else. The word partner no longer means business partner so on and so forth. Especially for some of us that, like I am in general practice, I'm in partnership. 
I always have to distinguish between the two when I'm talking of a part business partner and my wife. So I use the word wife. I don't even use the word partner. But for the person I'm speaking to, you have to clarify what you mean by partner when you say that, because it means a whole different thing today. What is the intention of all of that? It's to change how you think. Conform your mind to the Babylonian mindset. When the Bible says, do not be conformed to this world, this is the sort of thing it's talking about. Change the language. Number four thing that Nebuchadnezzar did was to change their food. Food is an integral part of people's culture. That's why when people migrate, they don't just leave their home country. They don't leave the food there. They take it with them. Right. Sometimes literally leave. And home office has to stop them. Do you have any fish or meat products here? And all those things become interesting. Now, but today, the spirit of Babylon feeds our mind with information targeted at re-engineering our minds. And you are bombarded with it. It's almost like you cannot escape it unless you leave the world. If you turn on the TV, it's there. Even if you're not watching the sort of program, you are deliberating choosing the program you want to watch. When you see the adverts, the advertising car, and you show two ladies kissing, and I'm thinking, what, what has that got to do with a car? You are bombarded with it. Even children's cartoons are not safe from it anymore. Those scenes are inserted there. Why? It's the spirit of Babylon. Change their food. It's on the radio, it's in the TV, it's in the print media. Even the children don't have a place of safety. You really, you, you almost have to watch it before you get, let your children watch it, before you, you decide. I, I don't remember how long ago it was when this husband and wife, they did a, a clip about even when your children hold the phone, it's almost like there's a big brother eye somewhere that knows it's your children holding it. And the adverts, the target at them will be different. And it was like they thought they were crazy. But that the wife was the one that first noticed. Now, when the wife holds the phone, that advert never plays for a long time. They gave it back the phone to the child. And within 10, 15 minutes, the advert comes up. And they're like, they are targeting our children with this thing. It becomes terrible. It's the spirit of Babylon. There is a goal behind it. There's an agenda. It's to change your mindset to that of the world. Because what you constantly feed your mind becomes the food of the mind and ultimately your way of life. It is a deliberate agenda of the spirit of Babylon. And finally, point number five, Nebuchadnezzar changed their literature. He changed their literature. They had to learn the literature of the Chaldeans. Just after the results of the 2021 census was published, just about two weeks ago or so, some people are already clamoring that the influence of the Church of England on our politics and education be removed. House of Lords be abolished. Education, Church of England schools be stopped. Now, it was therefore no surprise to me that Keir Starmer came up some, some days later with his policy, and one of it is that in a Labour government, they will abolish the House of Lords. But that's not for today. I'll talk about that another day. But today I want to talk about the beat about the education. Why on earth will anybody want the Church of England schools to be abolished? The Church of England to be stopped from running schools. For one, they have some of the best schools by a mile compared to other schools. Number two, they sponsor these schools. They are run by the charity's money, not the state money. In these days where we have a 50 billion hole to fill, why would anybody push that you put those schools back on government to pay for those? The reason is not because they, they, they are aiming for anything good. The reason is very simple. It's because they want to feed our children's mind with their own kind of literature, and the Church of England schools are like the final obstacles in the way to them. When you get rid of them, then on filtered curriculum, you can spread it however you want. You know, once my daughter had to ask a question at school, and I said, I thank God that it shows that what we're teaching you is getting in. That every time you are talking about diversity, 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 but the only diversity you ever teach us about is, is LGBT. 
that you don't talk about diversity of cultures, you don't talk about diversity of this, diversity. And the teacher, I think, was taken aback by that and said, eh, well, that's because there'll be times to talk about those. That every time, she, at her age, she noticed that every time they talk diversity, there's only one diversity they talk about. That's because that's the agenda. That's why I say on the surface, it looks good. You would not discern, but beneath is something else. What is wrong with diversity? Nothing. In the true sense of it, nothing. But when diversity only means one thing, then that's an agenda. That's not diversity. Having considered these five strategies, what can you do? Two things. Take a stand and make a difference. Take a stand and make a difference. This is what the four Hebrew boys did. Not once, not twice, not even three times. They took a stand for Christ and they made a difference. Take a stand for Christ. Let heaven, let earth and hell know that you are a Christian and that the Bible is your final authority. Boldly declare your position of, on issues, even if it means you get a bad name. Take a stand. You don't have to be obnoxious about it. You don't have to be stubborn about it unless you have to. Daniel negotiated when it was appropriate. In that verse we read, he negotiated with the chief eunuch. Can we do this? A trial of 10 days. Let us eat this. You see, and at the end of that, do what is fit. So there are times when it's not about, no, 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 no. You know, because sometimes you see people uh, unnecessarily take a stand when they don't need to take a stand. The times when they should take a stand, they did it. Like, I, I think, I don't know whether it was Canada or Australia, yeah, I think it must be one of those, those countries during COVID when the, the numbers were rising and they were asking churches to shut down and there was this pastor that said, I, I will still go ahead and hold services and all of that. that. That's not the kind of stand we're taking. That stand is an unreasonable, obnoxious stand. It, it, what does he achieve? They've not said that churches should not ever meet at all. You can meet through other mediums and it's something that will be reviewed in time. So that's not the kind of thing I'm talking about. But when you need to, there will be times when you need to take a stand and say, you know what? On this old ground, I am willing to break the law. And Daniel recognized when such a time came, when they said, you cannot pray to your God. And the guy, he didn't even argue. He just went to pray to his God. And whatever they wanted to do, they did. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even when they were going to be thrown into the fairy furnace, they still spoke to the king as politely as they can. They still called him, oh, king. They spoke to him as nicely. But we are not going to bow to your idol. So they took a stand. They didn't have to be obnoxious about it, but they made their stand. Commit to making a difference. These boys were so good. The Bible says that Daniel served under four kings. Four kings. These were wicked kings that came one after the other, yet none of them got rid of Daniel because he was so good. They were committed to making a difference. In that chapter 1 that we read earlier, if we are the, uh, towards the end of it, the Bible says, in all the matters that the king tested them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians in his kingdom. They were so good that the kingdom could not do without them. That, again, goes to a testament of who they are and the God they serve. Be the best at what you do. That in itself speaks volume. Earlier on, I referred to the one love protest when the FIFA World Cup started. Now, in the last two weeks, have you heard any more news about that one love issue over the last two weeks? No. It has died a natural death. Why did it do that? Because FIFA and the nation of Qatar took its stand. When the rest of the world saw that they were not going to bulge, they said, we better face our football. <laughs> and at the end of the day, they left them on that issue. That's what can happen when you take a stand. When you take a stand and say, we've taken up, up to this point. We are taking no more. The message gets back to everyone. So we need to start taking a stand. We are still 46.2% of England and Wales. We are still the majority, even though it's falling below 50%. We cannot allow ourselves to be subdued into silence. We can say, I take a position 
on what God has said in the Bible. I am free to take that position. It doesn't make me intolerant. It doesn't make me a non-progressive. It doesn't make me by God's head. If anything, you are the one being intolerant for not understanding my view. Take a stand. Take a stand. And unity is important. It's easier for me to take a stand if I know that if I get arrested after now, I can expect my members to raise placard and protest. Right. It's easier. Right. But if I know that everybody will just go back home and go and eat aku and all of that, then I will think twice before I do that. Right. Take a stand and be united as one front. In Acts chapter 4, verse 29, there's the story of how after the apostles have been harassed and molested for preaching the gospel, the Bible said they went back and prayed about one thing. Now, when I think about this take a stand, it's not something anybody can do by willpower. Amen? It's not something about willpower. If it's willpower, you would always fail along the way. Only people who make a practice of the presence of God that God becomes so real to them, more real than anything on earth, those are the people that can take a stand. You see, all th those apostles, their lives did not matter to them because they knew that even if they died and left their children and wives, God would take care of them. They knew that they themselves were going to a better place. They knew that nothing this life offered them was better than what God offered them in eternity. It's people that practice the presence of God. I saw a quote on, on Dr. Sonia Adelaide's uh, status yesterday, and I said, actually, this is true. He said, the more you mature in faith, the more spiritual realities become real to you more than the physical things you see. That's when, as your faith grows, spiritual realities become more real to you than the physical things. Acts 4.29, please, uh, media. If you can put that up for me. So this was what they prayed for. It said, now look, Lord, on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. Now, it's interesting to me that that's what they prayed for. They did not pray that the peace people that persecuted them should die or collapse or anything of that sort. They didn't even pray that the persecution should not come anymore. Because that would be a waste of prayer. Jesus told us persecution would come. Mm -hmm. But they prayed that they would receive boldness to be able to declare that position for Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's what we are going to pray for today. Mm -hmm. And as we practice God's presence, that boldness will come. Mm -hmm. When God becomes more real to you than any other thing in this world, then it's easy to take a stand for God. It's easy to take a stand. That's what we're going to pray for that boldness. Let us bow down our heads in prayer. I want us to speak to the Lord to grant us boldness to take a stand. To be able to take a position on the things that God himself has already taken a position on. Earlier, we sang the song by Paul Wilbur. There's another song of his that is titled, In Your Presence. That's where I belong. In your presence, that's where I'm strong. I want us to pray. That will be people that practice God's presence. That that will be our life. I think it was Watchman Nee that wrote a book, The Practice of God's Presence. That would be our lives. We will be people we will refuse our homes to be attacked. As men in this assembly, I want you to take a stand today and declare that Satan, my home, is untouchable. My marriage is untouchable. My children are beyond your boundaries. In the name of Jesus, I stand as the under-shepherd of this house. And I declare that I am taking a stand for Jesus. I sanctify the minds of my children. I protect them from the evil that flies about. In the name of Jesus. My children are taught of the Lord. In the name of Jesus. Speak over your mind. That the things you see around you. The literature, the language, the food. That the world wants to feed your mind. That you refuse to be conformed to this world. 
but you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind in the name of Jesus. Pray that the Lord will give you boldness that every opportunity that you have to take a stand for God and declare for Him that you will make that stand know that everybody that knows you let heaven, let earth, let hell know that your life is sold out to Jesus in the name of Jesus. Everywhere you go people will know you as an example of a believer in the name of Jesus. You will be God's voice in this generation in the name of Jesus. You are taking a stand, you are making a difference. In your work, you are set apart in the name of Jesus. As you make a practice of God's difference, you are set apart in the name of Jesus. Choir, if you know that song in your presence, help me with it in the name of Jesus. Thank you, mighty God. Lord, as we take a stand for you today, we pray that you fill us with the spirit of boldness in the name of Jesus. Help us to be people who always practice your presence in Jesus' name.